Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome co-founder of Databricks, Andy Konwinski. Thank you. Welcome back to the summit. This morning, we're going to jump right in. Our first talk is going to be by Reynold Shim, who is the chief architect of Spark at Databricks. Reynold will be talking about real time and Spark. Let's welcome Reynold. Thank you, Andy. So yesterday, all of you have heard Matei's keynote, and one thing he said is we're going to double down on streaming this year. And tonight, um, this morning, I'm going to be sharing with you some of our plans for the year for real time and streaming. So why real time? Um, I think this question is pretty obvious in general, that for some of the audience here, um, it's typically useful to actually make decisions faster, and sometimes it actually leads directly to bottom line. For example, credit card fraud detection. You probably want to actually flag the fraudulent um, credit card swipe as soon as it happens, rather than 10 days later, where you don't even know where the guy that's actually making the fraudulent transactions are anymore. And there's many other use cases. So in response to this, the industry kind of started this new trend or new generation of uh, systems called streaming engines. And streaming engines typically um, just takes an input stream, sometimes multiple input streams, and produces an output stream, or maybe multiple output streams. And what is a stream? Stream is really just an infinite list of data um, that grows over time. About three years ago, um, we kind of saw this trend in Spark as a result, um, actually, to try to design Spark from ground up to actually um, respond to this real-time demand. Um, one example of it is Spark SQL. Spark SQL can actually answer queries um, interactively very quickly. But the other more important component is Spark Streaming, which was actually introduced three years ago in Spark Point 7. This is probably way before most of you have heard of Spark. Um, and according to a survey we did last summer, actually half of the Spark users think um, Spark Streaming is actually the most important component of Spark. So the popularity is certainly on the rise. Um, Spark Streaming was our first attempt at unifying what we call batch computation, basic computation on static data, and streaming computation. So this is the real-time aspect of it. Um, it has many nice features that were uh, first of its kind in streaming engines, including like building stage management, um, exactly one semantics, which I'll explain in a minute. And there's also a lot of features that are um, very nice for scaling out the computation to very large workloads, such as straggler mitigation, load balancing, and uh, fast forward recovery. Now, just to touch upon exactly one semantics, what do I mean by that? For some of you that are less familiar with basically streaming computation. Um, typically, given some operation you want to do in streaming, there's three different ways you could do it. One is what we call at least one semantics. So you actually apply that um, computation at least once for any given event. The second one is at most one semantics. This means you apply the operation at most once. So imagine credit card fraud, um, actually, just imagine credit card swipe. Um, whenever a swipe happens, in the case of at most once um, semantics, you would basically charge the user at most once. So sometimes you might not charge a user, and sometimes you might charge a user. Doesn't sound very great. Um, what about at least once? It means you charge a user at least once, but you might double charge, you might triple charge. Doesn't sound very nice either. You could actually get an angry email from a user. So the first case, you would lose money. The second case, you might get angry emails. Now, both of these cases are actually really easy to do. I can give you a solution that requires no work. For example, for the case of at most once, just never charge your user. Just return immediately in that computation. Never run anything. In that case, you have at most once. Even though it's it, technically, you're always returning zero, but it's doing it at most once. Right? So now, typically what you really want is what we call exactly once, which means if the user swipes a credit card, you charge a user exactly once. Um, so since Spark Streaming was introduced about three years ago, we worked with hundreds of uh, streaming deployments with a lot of Spark users and customers. And um, we've learned a lot in this journey. And one thing we learned is streaming computation typically don't exist in isolation. It's actually typically combined with a lot of other um, kind of computations. 
So let's take a look into one use case again, just credit card fraud detection. In the case of credit card fraud detection, typically you have a stream of data that's just credit card swipes. And then you want to determine for each of the swipe whether you actually have a fraud or not. So these are anomalies that happen. Now just imagine I'm a credit card company and I've decided I'm gonna implement this uh, whole system in streaming. And I'll be using a very simple algorithm. And the algorithm is if the credit card transaction happens 50, outside of the 50 miles radius of the, my uh, user's residence, I'll flag it as fraud. Now, can I get a show of hands if any of you have gotten, gotten a credit card um, transaction denied because um, you might be traveling somewhere? Everybody. See, big data is still really not really solved. Now, this model is obviously not very good, but sometimes you will be surprised how far is actually, uh, um, you can actually use this model to get going. And, but what really happens is, as soon as you get more user complaints, you probably want to look into how you can actually improve the model. Now how can you improve the model? Actually, you typically involve some data scientists or analysts or modeling um, team that's actually go and look at historic data to actually understand the trends and um, spending patterns better so you can build better models. And at the same time, you might actually have a different uh, stream that's actually updating some machine learning model that's actually in real time to actually improve the model you're already using in production. And typically, this um, streaming pipeline might be actually different from the streaming pipeline that's actually happening with the credit card fraud. Because in the case of uh, fraud detection, you want to actually flag the fraud as soon as it happens, maybe in the range of milliseconds or hundreds of milliseconds. Whereas in the case of training a new model, you probably don't want to be actually deploying your model in a 100 millisecond interval, because at some point you might want humans to actually step in and take a look to see whether the model actually makes sense or not. So um, this use case, use case itself involves multiple streams, involves actually looking at um, data, historic data, in an interactive fashion, and also involves running a lot of batch computation. You look at a lot of different use cases. This is not unique. As a matter of fact, a lot of the streaming use cases actually involve many, many non-streaming components. Um, as a result, we actually um, decided to actually call this class of applications um, continuous application, give it a new name. So what is a continuous application? Continuous application is just an end-to-end -end application that acts on real-time data. It's a very simple definition. With this definition, you could almost call any application a continuous application. So, since we um, studied this pattern, we wanted to look at how Spark can actually simplify the building of continuous applications. Now, what makes building co continuous applications difficult? And I think there are two um, reasons they are difficult to build. The first is it's very difficult to actually, in general, integrate streaming systems with non-streaming systems, which is actually typically necessary in continuous applications. It's difficult to actually have interactive analysis on live streaming data it's very hard to run batch um, computation on historic um, streaming data with a consistent view of the data. It is very hard to actually output um, streaming data onto some relational database in a consistent fashion with exactly one semantics. And it's also very hard to do machine learning on streaming data. And the second one is streaming computation model is extremely difficult. It's difficult to understand, it's difficult to learn, it's difficult to reason about. Let me give you one simple case. It can't really get simpler. We have a stream with some traffic logs. We pipe this stream um, into a streaming engine, and all we want to do is to aggregate some count. So I want to see how often each page gets visited um, at any given moment. And maybe I'm doing just some simple analysis after this. Maybe I'm actually charging my clients based on how much traffic I've generated for their website. Now, this seems really simple in this case. What can go wrong? It turned out there's a lot of things that can actually go wrong. For example, one of the processes that's actually collecting the logs might be slow and send you the records or the logs that are actually delayed. Some logs might actually literally show up two days later. In a distributed system, you might actually have some nodes that are outputting your data to your MySQL database, and the other nodes actually not functioning and not outputting, so you're actually getting partial data. Your whole pipeline might fail, 
and when it recovers, it might actually give you inconsistent result. There's a lot of other problems that could happen. And which actually leads to streaming computation model being extremely difficult in a three different dimensions. The first dimension is data. It's very hard to reason about data in streaming computation because data might arrive late. And data have varying distributions over time, which means one algorithm that might work in a particular given instance of time might not work in the future. Processing is fairly difficult because over time, your logic might actually change. You want to apply new uh, machine learning algorithm, you might want to actually change your um, whole algorithm completely. And there's also new kinds of operations, such as windowing and sessions. And last but not least, the output um, is actually difficult to define, because now you have uh, some sort of time span you need to define what, how, what output actually means over time and how do you define correctness. So for the past few years, we've been thinking about how we can actually simplify streaming computation. So we don't want only the PhDs in computer science that can actually understand this and build robust streaming applications. We want to really take it um, to the scale to the masses. And I think finally, we have a satisfying answer that we ourselves are happy with. And I'm going to share it with you today. And what we're calling this structured streaming. And it comes with one simple realization which is the simplest way to perform streaming computation is to not having to reason about streaming. Now you heard me right. I did drink my coffee this morning. I'm not making this up. The simplest way to perform streaming analytics is to not having to reason about streaming. What do I mean by that? So in Spark 1.3, which was early about a year ago, we introduced data frames. And what data frames expose is a very simple API. This similar to the tools that people have been using um, on their single node tools. And you can use data frames, so interactive, and um, in the batch mode, deal with historic data. So we thought, what if, in Spark 2.0, we just expand data frames and generalize it to deal with infinite amount of data, and introduce a new concept, a new API, called streaming data frames. So you can run the same data frame operations just on a stream. So a new API in Spark 2.0 for streaming data frames. But then we thought, nobody really wants that. It'd be so much easier if you have a single API with just existing data frames. So that's what we actually did, structured streaming. It's essentially extending the pre-existing data frame API um, as a high-level a streaming API that builds on the Spark SQL engine. And what it does, you can actually run the same data frame operations over um, a stream with new operations such as um, event time support, windowing and sashing, and streaming specific sources and syncs. And this is our attempt, second attempt, and I think maybe the best so far, uh, to actually unify streaming, interactive, and batch queries so you can substantially simplify continuous applications. Examples such as aggregating data in a stream and actually output it into some MySQL database should just work out of the box. Or even better, maybe just within Spark, you could actually query directly the state that's being accumulated, aggregated. And you should be able to pipe it directly into the machine learning library in Spark and use that on a live stream. So for the next five minutes, geek warning, I'll dive a little bit more into the details, um, which is probably um, atypical for a keynote. Um, but bear with me for those that are slightly higher level. And for, I think for those developers, you probably actually like this. right? So let me explain the model. First, we have time. This is just your normal time. There's nothing special here. And we have a concept called a trigger. And what a trigger is, it just defines how often you should run some data frame operation. All right, in this case, I have a trigger of every second. So every second, something's supposed to happen. Now, from the beginning of time to the first second, my stream has accumulated some data. In this case, I've defined a data frame query. Let's say it's just some simple aggregation. So I will, it's the simplest one, just count. I want to count how many records I have. Now, this will output basically one record when I run this query on the data that's accumulated from time zero to time one. And I just want to output all of this, which is a single number out, to some output. Now, in time two, I've accumulated more data. So at time two, I have all the data from time one plus the data from time one to time two. And I have my same query again, just count. Now run this count on all the data, and then just give me another number. And I output this number again. 
And same thing with time three, except this time I'm running all the data from time zero to time three. Right, sometimes, in this case, we'd actually output all the data all the time um, for my um, computation. Sometimes you might actually want to output delta. So this is, for example, if I only run, um, if I'm basically just doing some ETL and have new data that arrive, maybe I only want to just output only the da new data, not all of the data. Right, so just to recap this very simple model, there's four concepts. This input stream, so input sources, it's really just a table that's a pen only, so it keeps growing over time. It becomes infinite. And this queries, which are just typical normal data frame or SQL queries, um, with new operators for windowing and sessioning. And there are triggers, which indicates how often this query gets run. And as output modes, and we think we're gonna support three different output modes, it includes complete, which is always output all the data, and then delta, which is to output, obviously, only the differences between the different triggers. And then update in place, so we can actually update some external system in place directly. All right. Now, let me give you a couple more examples, so slightly more concrete to help you understand this. Let's say in the case of if you're building a streaming ETL, which is actually, turns out, one of the most frequent uh, use cases for uh, doing streaming is to ETL something continuously. So I have data that's in S3 um, on some bucket, and then I have some data, say, like log files in JSON. I just want to transform it um, to parquet files so it's more efficient for query. So the query here is very simple, just some simple math that turns JSON into parquet. And for, my, for the purpose of this application, I just want to run every five seconds. And output mode is I want to own basic delta, so only for new records. And I'll output it directly back into some S3 buckets. So this is how I would define this job. Now the second one, which is similar to uh, an early example, is to run page view count. I just want to count how many times for each uh, minute um, each of the page on my website has been visited. So the input might be some logs that's generated by my HTTP server um, in Kafka. It's coming from Kafka. And then the query is very simple. I'm using sort of a SQL query to actually explain it. It's basically just counting, grouping by the page and the minute. And trigger is, again, I want this slightly faster, so I want to run it every five seconds. And the output mode is I just want to update directly in my SQL database I have. So I don't need to uh, query in Spark or anything. I can just query the MySQL database I have. Now, the nice part about actually this one is sometimes data might arrive late which I was talking about in my early example. And conceptually, this should actually automatically correct my output if I update in place when the data is arriving late. So if some data arrives like two days later, my MySQL database that contains actually all the accounts will get automatically updated. So, some of you are suspicious, like I see from your face. First, I walked up stage and told you the best way, the easiest way to do streaming is to not think about streaming. And now I'm telling you, we should just run all the data all the time. If I want, if I want something to happen at time three, I run all, this query on all the data from time zero to time three. What's this guy smoking? All right, so what I've just explained to you is actually the logically how you should reason about this new model, structured streaming. Essentially, you're just applying data frame operations on static data, and think about data from zero to like some time when the query is run. But when we actually execute it, this is actually very similar to how data frames always been executed. What this logical programming model is giving you is making it as simple to specify streaming queries as just static data. And then what it really generates is for all the operations you're doing, we generate a logical plan. And Spark, actually through the Catalyst Optimizer, is going to turn this plan into a continuous and incremental query that will actually run in an efficient mode, rather than running through all the data all the time. Let's go back to the, some um, aggregation example. Let me give you, actually show you some code of what this would look like. So, this is your, this is like how you run some aggregation in data frames. It looks fairly, for those of you that are familiar with data frames, it's, it's probably self-evident what's actually going on. Um, we're just reading some JSON data from um, S3 logs, and then I'm grouping by a few user ID, I'm just aggregating, and we count, for example, 
uh, or sum up the total amount of time my users have spent on uh, each of the page or each of the user. And I want to write it out to JDBC database. This is how we exp um, express this against static data. So under this new model, the way you actually express this for streaming continuous aggregation is to just replace those two calls with dot stream. And now you can actually drop new files, new logs that are shipped from maybe some other system into that street. And every time a new file appears, we would actually pick it up and run through this pipeline and then actually output it in place, in this case, to some MySQL database. And of course, it would be bad if you run this query a year from now on all the data from now to the year later. So the way it actually works is the first time Spark SQL sys actually a JSON file in the S3 bucket is going to do some aggregate. The second time a new block of data arrives, Spark SQL is going to do the aggregate except in an incremental fashion. So we we'll only be aggregating on the latest data and we actually combine automatically the data from historic aggregates without actually users having to worry about this at all. And when the new one arrives again, same thing will happen over and over and over again. So this is actually not something we're only doing about streaming. Um, as I said, continuous applications really needs more than just streaming. And as a result, the rest of Spark will actually follow and be revamped to support this. So for example, um, one thing that should actually work out of the box, the interactive query against streaming data should just work because we're using the same data frame abstraction. There's only a single API. And the second is Spark. We've introduced a new Spark data source API that can actually support exactly one semantics end to end. And the reason this is worth highlighting is actually a lot of streaming systems, I think Spark Streaming might have been one of the first streaming systems that support um, exactly one semantics. So you don't want to charge a user either less or more times. The, um, um, it turns out a lot of the streaming engines are work with exactly one semantics within the engine itself. But as soon as you actually want to involve some output operations, it's actually very difficult to guarantee you have exactly one semantics. So within the engine, when I'm doing all my aggregates and all of that, I can guarantee records get processed once. But as soon as I want to actually write it out to say MySQL, Oracle, any other things, exactly one semantics breaks. Here, we actually want to uh, have exactly one um, semantics end to end, which means from beginning to end for all of this. And we have um, different output more supports that supports actually writing out all the data, just partial data in a delta fashion, or updating data in place. Right. And machine learning algorithm will also be updated to actually support all of this. So besides a very simple programming model that you only need to really think about batch data because you all have already know how to do it just by using the rest of Spark or from other systems, what are the things that this can do that's actually difficult with other engines at the moment? I think there's a few things. One is worth highlighting. It's actually very difficult to do ad hoc interactive queries directly on the stream in a consistent snapshot fashion. And the second is dynamic changing queries. I touched upon this earlier when I was talking about credit card fraud detections. Maybe sometimes you want to change your algorithm completely, and you don't want to bring down your entire stream, um, streaming applications or continuous applications. So this should actually support removing and adding new queries automatically, dynamically. And of course, you also get the benefit of Spark. You can have elastic scaling, you can have fault tolerance, and all that in this new engine. So we keep all the nice perks Spark always had, and we're adding many new features with this much simpler programming model. And really, what we want is if you need to build ever something like this, or, um, or even more complicated than this, it should be a lot simpler. A lot of things should just work out of the box without you having to worry about all the nitty gritty details about streaming. So I'm just going to end the talk with a little bit of timeline. Um, as Matei announced, Spark 2.0 uh, will probably be released um, at the end of April or in the beginning of May. Um, in Spark 2.0, we'll be having this API foundations built up. And really, it's not a lot of new things from user's point of view because it's really just data frames. You don't, there's no new thing to learn. It's just a new data frame API and plus the dot stream functions. And then there will be, in the first version, Kafka data sources with the file system data sources and file system data syncs, and also databases, because we thought it's, a lot of you probably have some relational database running, and we want actually to integrate out of the box with that, with basically the correct semantics. So you don't have to worry about doing that. And we'll have to also support for event time integrations. 
In Spark 2.1 and beyond, it's a little bit hard to predict where exactly each version um, the features through LAN, because um, we're going to put a lot of efforts into actually making this expressible in SQL, so actually even some of your analyst friends can actually use this without using typing any code. And then there's BI app integration that's built in, um, plus other uh, machine learning sources and things, and um, uh, streaming sources and things and machine learning. All right, so this is the end of my talk. Um, thank you. Michael Ambras will be giving a talk, I believe it's uh, one of the first uh, technical sessions of the day, to talk about how this actually connects with rest of Spark structure. I think the title of the talk is called Structuring Spark from Streaming All the Way to Data Sets to Data Frames. Um, if you want to know more about the details of this, I uh, encourage you to check out that talk. Thanks a lot for coming. <laughs>
in both SQL and graph format and be able to query those systems, apply them to the models that we build, and execute those models to make scoring decisions. So we operate in a really sophisticated environment with fraud rings that know a lot of different attack vectors. I won't get into all the details about what we see internally at Capital One, but we do see a lot of activity around synthetic IDs, hijacked accounts, stolen IDs, things like that where fraud rings will attack, come in through one of those different channels that I mentioned earlier, try and get some action to take place and then exploit that through another channel. So the systems that we're building are trying to combine defenses around data sets that combine from those different systems. And one of the things, you know, we're here in New York City, we've got a lot of our competitors probably in the room, certainly nearby in the city. And so as a publicly traded company, we we're very sensitive about what we could talk about uh, and so I wanted to give you just a quick flavor of how we build our fraud scoring engine, and then I want to move on quickly to some prototypes. So here's some background. This was, uh, this was what they were telling me I was allowed to say publicly of how we compute things. <laughs> so if you work for any of our competitors, I need you to leave now, and uh, we'll talk about some of the prototypes we're building. All right, so in, in, in truth, we use a lot of different technologies in our big data ecosystem. We're a very innovative company. We would like to experiment with different approaches. And so you'll see a full range of things here. In addition to that, we, we toy with all the different public cloud providers. So let me talk a little bit about one prototype we've built in Amazon specifically, but we've actually done this in other cloud providers as well. But we, we leverage some of the work that Databricks has done. They've written a great blog. You see the URL posted down there. We've taken data from our data centers, we've piped it into uh, Amazon, into Redshift specifically using the parallel copy capabilities that you can run through S3 and into Redshift. So you see that there. We then take that data and using the Spark Redshift package from Databricks, we actually parallel copy the data back out, run it through a Spark cluster. You see the transformations that are taking place to produce the data frames. We then take that data set and we create both tabular and graph views of that data. We then take those views of the data and apply the models and the machine learning algorithms and run it against it for fraud detection. So what we're looking for here is those hijacked accounts, synthetic IDs. We're looking for nearest neighbors, for people who are applying for credit cards. Have they applied before? Have they, are they actually existing customers looking for a new credit card or an upgraded credit card? Are they people who have applied before and have been declined for one reason or another? Uh, are they applying because they're part of a ring and there's some attributes about their application, whether it's clickstream data or information that we collect through the application process that tips us off that they're somehow connected to someone else that might be fraudulent? So let me talk quickly about a few highlights for what we've seen with our Spark development journey. So we're prototyping new and sophisticated models. In fact, we're able to run models in parallel in the cluster and be able to score things and see different results from different scoring engines. Uh, the tabular and graph representations of data simultaneously is an important feature. And then we're doing things like auto-deploying things out, which is pretty common using Chef into AWS. Uh, we're writing code internally that some of which will open source, but some of the things we're doing internally for auto-scaling our, our clusters are based, currently based on CPU utilization and we're trending more towards outstanding tasks and scaling up as the task load increases. And another thing that we've done to externalize the data pipeline workflow is we've developed our own mini language or DSL, if you will. And so I'll show you an example of it here. It's a JSON class or a JSON file that describes the workflow. So we externalize the steps that you need to, to follow. We can have data sets that are pulled in. And so in this example, it's just a, a sample workflow where we would pull data in from an S3 bucket, run a filter on it to filter out customers, say, for a marketing campaign, to find those customers that have over $100,000 in annual income. And then we would write out the results for our marketing teams to, to, uh, to use as part of their campaigns. So Capital One is quickly becoming a world-class software company. We are modeling ourselves after many of the great software companies that exist out there. And one of the things that we've adopted in the last few years is a full agile strategy for how we build software. So this is beyond just our software engineers. We are actually uh, 
in partnership with our business. The business is going through and defining the priorities for the applications we build in an agile manner. Uh, we are getting our teams to be multi-skilled. So you see here we've got full stack development teams where for any project we will pull engineers from different tiers of the application stack and, and bring them in as part of an overall team. Uh, one of the things that we've got to worry ourselves over a lot, when we, especially as we look at various public cloud providers, is the data encryption, data security around PII and PCI data. Uh, while at the same time encrypting that or tokenizing that information, trying to preserve the analytic value that's important for our analysts and, and obviously the fraud models that we run. So we've got world-class talent. We continue to hire. We hired thousands of engineers and data scientists this past year. We'll continue to do that. And this is kind of the prototypical model of what we're looking for. We're trying to take our existing statisticians who are very strong in SQL and have some general programming experience, educate them on the Spark uh, environment, educate them in Python, Scala, Java, and try and get everybody in the company thinking about distributed computing, what it means to process both structured and unstructured data, be able to be multilingual program in, in different programming languages, and then clearly understand the importance of algorithms and machine learning. So, it's a short talk today, but wanted to uh, wanted to thank Databricks, especially we've we've been working with them in training, uh, and obviously some of the work that they're doing uh, around the Spark community, and then uh, the blog post that they posted that we use to leverage our prototype. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Chris. Our next speaker is from uh, our next speaker is from what was recently Razor Site, but is now Synchronos, and he is the VP, the uh, Senior Director of Big Data Platforms. Excuse me. Please welcome with me to the stage, Saren Nathan. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's great to be here at the Spark Summit, and uh, I'm excited to have this opportunity to talk to you today. Before I start, I just want to do a quick audience poll. Um, how many of you are currently in or have been in the trenches doing data munging, wrangling, cleansing, and all of those good stuff? Okay, so hopefully this talk is for you. Um, I can assure you when this journey began, I had a full set of hair. Uh, but then again, you know, correlation is not causation, so. <laughs> All right. Uh, who am I? I'm uh, the Senior Director of uh, Big Data Platforms and Framework at Synchronos. Uh, we were recently acquired, I mean, I was with Razorside, recently acquired by Synchronos late last year. Uh, been in this space for a long time, and then my goal is to solve real business problems with uh, the latest technology. Um, that's what everybody wants to do, but let me say that anyway. So how many of you have heard of Synchronos? Okay, Synchronos is a publicly traded company. We're headquartered right 45 minutes away in Jersey, and uh, we offer uh, personal cloud and activation platforms for large enterprises and communications providers around the globe. So what does that mean? So if you use a mobile device, any mobile device, chances are Synchronos is actually working behind the scenes for you. So whether it's activating your device on the network, whether it is migrating content, synchronizing contacts, whether it is setting up a personal cloud environment for you to move content back and forth, your pictures, your videos, Synchronos' platform and software is enabling all of that. So our solutions help operators connect to their customers. So whether you're onboarding a customer in the form of a device, uh, whether you're allowing them to synchronize data back and forth from the device to the cloud to other devices, or in um, if you're driving a connected car, uh, the latest cars have 4Gs in them, Synchronos activates the connected cars. If you have a connected home, 
Synchronous probably activates a connected home. So that is the ecosystem we are in. And Razor said used to offer predictive analytic solutions to the communications vertical. So the marriage is all about applying our platform and products and models to the solutions that Synchronous offers. So we are part of the Synchronous Analytics Group. Um, just to give a sample of what is big data at Synchronous, what do we do? This is just a sample for one operator, a large operator who's deployed the personal cloud solution. We're talking about um, you know, 30 million active subscribers on the app, about 8 million daily active subscribers or users. They're uploading anywhere from tens to hundreds of millions of pictures every day. So the data size is staggering. We have deployed the solution across five data centers running on multiple clusters and all the good stuff. So this is truly big data, all those events coming from those devices that can be used to improve the customer experience, whether it is um, looking at a better application functionality, whether it's looking at crash analysis, predicting failures, rolling out of applications and uh, release versions, all of those good stuff can the, the data can be used for. So, what does my team do? We are responsible for the uh, big data platforms and frameworks that is used to generate those consistent analytics. Um, the platform is deployed both on a private cloud and in uh, public cloud AWS infrastructure. And when we talk about analytics here, we talk about the full range. So it starts with the traditional descriptive analytics or BI world and the advanced predictive analytics. So both end of the spectrum are there. We have internal users, we have customer users who consume this, uh, this insights generated from the data. Um, you should be very familiar with this. In order to make any meaningful use of the data, it has to be processed. So right from ingestion all the way to profiling, parsing, transforming, enriching, aggregation, Etc. down to the downstream processes, which may visualize it, which may apply models on top of it. This is what we're talking about, data pipeline process. I'm going to walk you through what we've gone through. I mean, what does this mean? It's not simple. People waffle over it. But this is where we spend most of our lives. Uh, data is uh, not necessarily clean. The data is not necessarily structured, semi-structured. The definitions are missing, legacy systems. There's all sorts of things happening in here. So, our journey started with uh, a version one back in the day, and you folks should be very familiar with this. This is the day of the uh, multiple ETL jobs running uh, outside the context of data. Um, storage and processing were separated. Things were running in long-running batches. Um, whenever we encountered any large volumes of data set, the latency increased. There's no support for unstructured data. Historically speaking, these sort of solutions took a year to put in place, and it's pretty expensive, inflexible, large teams working across. We could not store large amounts of data online because of obvious restrictions. So this was the, the life back then. Then we entered into an appliance world where, okay, we'll put the uh, storage and processing together in one verticalized appliance. It was great, performance improved, latency reduced. But cost increased. Still, we had to do it in batches, although low latency batches. Still, we couldn't support um, unstructured data. Still, the costs were so prohibitive that we couldn't store the data there. We had to do it just, just in time processing, maybe store a limited amount of data and move it out somewhere else. Didn't work out. So move on to the next version. Then the whole Hadoop thing came about and said, let's go there. Um, we looked at that. And he said that, you know, uh, there's a big skills gap here to uh, have a, a bunch of people who are familiar with certain technologies and to migrate into that. He said, let's take a pause and see where this is headed before jumping in. And we saw MapReduce, uh, Pig, Hive, and a whole bunch of other acronyms. Um, so we said, let's take a, a pause on that. It, we didn't want to do a technology migration for the heck of it. Uh, what we realized was the, um, the benefits would not be there immediately. So uh, a couple of years ago, mercifully, out came Spark. 
So Spark provided a promise. It had everything required for pipelining. It had streaming, it had batch, it had SQL access, it had um, rich features, uh, in-memory storage, so performance was better. So we said, let's take a look at that and let's centralize our pipeline process on this platform. So this is what we call our V4 um, data pipeline. ETLs are closer to data. We can process stream or batches, superior performance compared to MapReduce and other options. What we did this time is we didn't want to open it up for every single developer or app developer out there. We abstracted it and built a framework. So we said all the components needed for data pipeline processing, let's build components and then expose those components to those app developers for them to hook it up in a data pipeline process. So it simplified the design. It significantly reduced the time for us to roll out a solution. And it, uh, it was highly flexible for us too. So um, with that, I'm going to go into data profiling. This is interesting. Good old days, we had uh, volumes of data. And when you want to do profiling, especially for the uh, modelers, um, they would say that uh, take a sample, and then we'll, we'll profile the data in a sample, and then utilize it to build the model. But then in the big data world came all the, the conventional wisdom is, no, use the full population. Uh, don't use the sample. Run your model, train your model on the full population. OK. Uh, then there are others that say, put everything in the lake, and then somehow everything will work out. Uh, how does that work? Uh, we still have to go through what the data is, uh, to still need to understand the, the construct. So why, why do we still, we still need data profiling. We need to understand what is in those data sets. We need to understand metrics. We need to understand the risks associated with creating rules. I mean, when you want to create an analytic data set, Oftentimes, you have to stitch the data to create that analytic record, which then could be used by the modeler. So when you stitch it, how do you generate the right rules? How do you make sure the quality of the data is good? Can we identify the metadata from the data set so that we can create uh, those configurations that can be used in the pipeline process instead of manually hooking it together? How do we understand the challenges of data and inconsistencies ahead of time? So anything you find later in a cycle is always more expensive and tough to, uh, to fix. Also, another uh, uh, category of solutions came where we want to do ad hoc search, ad hoc full text search. So in order to do those, you need to tag the data. How can you do tagging of data, categorize the data without profiling? So profiling became a key aspect of that as well. So um, when we looked at this challenge, and this is where most of the time was spent, if you broke down the project life cycle, munging, wrangling, whatever term you want to use, that's where most of the time was spent. And um, if you really broke it down, there was a lot of touch points. So from the time the ingestion location data was moved to some other location, and there were money policies, security concerns. So moving data here and there was not possible. And um, as a result of all of that, there was, you know, just the interest level in any project is how soon it can be delivered. If it takes two months, and uh, multiple months, then the, the, the opportunity is typically lost. So we wanted to address this particular challenge. So um, the typical scenario, I'm not saying everybody has this, but I have seen uh, this many a time. We have analysts, business analysts, want to get a bunch of data into an Excel or somewhere else and look at it. Uh, big data, you cannot do that. Okay, so we'll put that in a database and run our profiler, but then you cannot put it in a database unless you know what the data is, what the schema is, what the structure is. Um, we get data from customers and they say, this is what it is, but it's nowhere close to what it is. So that went cycle time there to figure out what, what exactly did you send us type of thing. Um, you, you couldn't move data back and forth. That's the point. The, fundamental problem. You could not move it from a, a data lake location into a database or back to some other store. So all of those dependencies were uh, causing a huge uh, headache. So what did we need? We need speed. We need agility. We need automation. How do we automate this thing? How do we put the power back with the business analyst or data analyst? So we set out with this is the minimum data profiler requirements. We said all data is going to reside in the data lake. 
So you should be able to profile the data in the data lake. You should be able to review and validate the data. You should be able to review the statistics of the data. You should be able to use that same results to create metadata to, f to run your um, um, data pipeline processing. You should also potentially be able to create downstream, uh, downstream schema. So if you're going to load this data into an index or into a downstream database, you should be able to create the schemas automatically. These were the um, goals that we set out to achieve. So Spark uh, came to the rescue. We have large data sets, multiple data objects. We can move that into an RDD, split it up uh, by field, and run all sorts of metrics. We can use um, built-in transformations by Spark. That was very nice. Performance was great. So how does this work? So the simple flow is we have a, a very usable uh, web application. The user, all the user does is points to a data lake location and say pick up a, a set of files based on mask, uh, the full set of data objects, and then launch the Spark application, which then runs in the background, profiles the entire data set, and publishes the result to a repository, which is viewable in the web application. Pretty simple. What it generates is a bunch of univariate statistics, whether you are a numerical field or a non-numeric field. There's a whole bunch of things that is needed by the data scientist to say how many nulls, do we, can we create imputation rules out there, what's the health of those various attributes, or the histogram, kurtosis, mean, median, all those good stuff comes out, uh, which can be used. This can be for an individual data set. It can be for any data in the data lake. It could be merged data, stitched data, enriched data. At the end of the day, these things are important before you can start the modeling process. So this is a sample screenshot. What it looks like is a simple Angular web app. You can go in there and pull up a result of a particular data set profile, give you, uh, you know, a color-coded health of a data field, green, orange, red, however you want to set the threshold. Uh, it'll present all those statistics about the data field, whether it's, uh, you know, amount of null, histograms, your box charts, things like that. So uh, in language that is very usable for the data analyst or business analyst or data scientist. It also generates, uh, as I mentioned, full-fledged JSON um, metadata. So when you process the profiler, the profiler looks at all the fields. It does not only, it understands, it generates the data type, it generates the, the content statistics, it also generates the, uh, the JSON uh, metadata, which then is used by the data pipeline workflow. So if you want to operate on that uh, data set to transform it, enrich it, you could use this metadata to drive that. It also generates schemas, uh, downstream DDLs automatically from the profile output. So a user doesn't have to go in and create all of that. Some data sets are very large and there are 40, 50 of them, you can see how much time can be saved by just profiling it, creating the data set, I mean, the DDL. The advantages are you can, all the source data already is in the data lake. It's been dumped into the data lake for the, uh, the data location. All the profiling can be done in the data lake. There's no need to move the data back and forth. You can profile the entire data set. You don't have to work with the sample. You can integrate the, the results into a metadata configuration or a downstream DDL. All of this saves a tremendous amount of time. It might sound trivial, but for those of us who go through this for a living, it's a lot of time. So objective is to send cleaner data down to the modelers because at the end of the day, if you want to generate rules, uh, if you want to generate enrichment, the data pipeline process can be built accurately to cater to the needs of the, the data scientists downstream. So we've seen significant improvement as a result of this sort of approach. Uh, what used to take weeks, sometimes days, now is cut down to hours. The overall data pipeline process has been reduced 80%, I would say, uh, which is why we say from the time we receive the data, we can put out full-fledged metrics in the form of, you know, let's say dashboards and uh, descriptive insights in under a month. Um, we have identified data quality issues, sometimes that trip us up ahead of time. 
empowered the business analytics as well. Uh, anyway, so I want to quickly go through this. This is just one component of our pipeline process. Profiling is the first part, but when we built the stack from the ground up with Spark, we said, you know what, we need a multi-layer architecture, each layer logically performing a particular function, right, from ingestion to data storage to data processing to modeling to integration to consumption. It's a, it's a pretty layered infrastructure there, and this is the architecture we have in place today. We, we just talked about the uh, data management layer. So the framework components, they're all Spark components, um, at least in the profiling, parsing, transformation, integration layer. Each component has a set of functions. These components can be hooked up in a simple Uzi workflow, completely configurable through metadata. Uh, so the building blocks are available for the app developers. They don't have to sit in and write all those transformations. In fact, in the profiling and parsing, we have our own scripting engine. Um, integrated into that, so it's very easy to transform data. Right, some cleansing rules, lookups, substitutions, imputations, all of that are very easy to do uh, with this sort of framework approach. If you look at the architecture, uh, we have the data lake, uh, we have the orchestration layer, which is, uh, which is a Uzi, and then we have all the, the, the green boxes there are components in the pipeline, whether it's a SQL engine or a data prep engine or a database loader using scoop or a partitioner, the whole thing is uh, built in in a component uh, fashion. And then if you look at the stack itself, we have a certain, a certain software um, uh, in there. We've used Elasticsearch for index uh, storage for quick retrieval ad hoc analysis. We have the data lake, just a MAPR distribution. We use Spark extensively in the data processing arena. We have our own um, AngularJS uh, visualization layer. What's next? We expand it. We continue to expand our component set and move more into the value aspect of it, bivariate analysis, multicollinearity, all of those things that uh, typically is done on the data. We want to componentize that and string it together in the, uh, in the data pipeline uh, as, a, as after the univariate. This is the variable creation or the analytic set creation. I'm going to zip it through here. So the lessons learned here is uh, let the business drive technology adoption. There are a lot of hidden costs. Um, plan incremental updates, deliver something to the business periodically, simplify the whole thing. Um, Framework-based development is very, very helpful to speed up delivery and also uh, reduce our overall cost. I mean, at the end of the day, what our customers need is what is on the right. I know when a customer calls into a contact center, they want to know what is the lifetime value, what is the churn risk. What is the profitability? That's the kind of information they want. All the stuff on the left, that's the big data stuff, right? So we are all, all about delivering what's on the right to the customer to, to use the data insights to better their business. With that, I will end my talk. Thanks for the opportunity. <laughs>